Well, whether we admit it or not, one of the key emotions that motivates us to do things or to say things is the emotion of fear. Fear often plays a dominant role in the decisions we make and even the words that we speak or the words we don't speak. There are many things to fear in this life of ours. Many people today, for example, fear loneliness. As we heard a few, a few weeks back in our anthropology series, though we are more connected than, than any generation prior, we are also the most lonely. Um, many people, especially young people today, are deathly afraid of being alone. Others, though, today fear change, right? The idea of going somewhere different or experiencing something new sends uncomfortable goosebumps down our backs, right? The idea of culture shock, for example, is, is a, it's a terrifying reality for many of us, causing us to avoid and sometimes even despise any place or person who's different from us. And yet still others are deathly afraid of what I'm doing right now, public speaking. Right? It's actually believed that some 75% of Americans admit they have glossophobia or the horrible fear of public speaking. It's actually said to outrank the fear of spiders and the fear of death, apparently. Um, my point is, fear is an incredibly powerful motivator. And it's interesting that, that many of our deepest fears are actually all rooted in a common fear, which is the fear of man. The fear of man. Think about it, the, the, the fear of loneliness, not being accepted or loved by others, right? The fear of culture shock is not being able to fit in with others or looking different than others. The fear of public speaking, not being accepted by others, they're, they're all deeply connected to others, right? The fear of man is a strong motivator. But of these fears that I've mentioned, what if I told you you need to deal with all of these at the same time? It'd be a little stressful for some of us, probably, right? Well, we're about to get a glimpse of what that might look like in, in the experience of Paul in Acts 17. Acts chapter 17 is our passage today, verses 16 to 34. And we find Paul in this very situation dealing with the fear of loneliness and culture shock and public speaking. So let's look, if you haven't turned yet, Acts 17. Now at the beginning of Acts 17, we saw Paul and Silas move through Macedonia, right? Finally arriving in Thessalonica. And where Paul, we know, reasoned with the Jews in the synagogues, right? After meeting hostility there, they were sent by the brothers 40 miles west to Berea, as we saw last week, where they met those more noble Jews who faithfully examined the scriptures. <clears throat> Yet as we also saw last week, the Thessalonian Jews heard that the gospel was going forth in Berea, and so what did they do? They, they chased them down, didn't they? They followed them to Berea to try to silence the gospel. Acts 17, verse 14, then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Right? And that's where we pick up today. They arrive in Athens, Greece. Paul says to his friends, thanks for your help. Tell Silas and Timothy to get here ASAP. <laughs> so they drop him off there and they leave. That's where we begin our passage today. Verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Full of idols. So up to this point, Paul has consistently traveled with a group. Right? We've seen his missionary team of Barnabas and John Mark early on, and then more recently with Silas and Timothy and even Luke. But now Paul is completely and utterly alone in a very strange place. 
Athens was known as the epicenter of Greco-Roman culture. A little bit about Athens here. It's actually the, the foundation, many say, of Western civilization as we know it. Athens is at the southeastern point of Greece off the Aegean Sea. Classical Athens dates back to 500 B.C., though it was conquered by the Romans in 146 B.C. Athens is by far one of the most important cities of human history. One author puts it this way, the, the sculpture, literature, and oratory of Athens in the 5th and 4th centuries B.C. remain unsurpassed. In philosophy, too, she took the leading place, being the native city of Socrates and Plato and the adopted home of Aristotle, Epicurus, and Zeno, who was the founder of Stoicism. So here we have Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, right, the Jew of Jews, trained up in the law of God, being dropped off now by himself on the shores of Athens, the, the New York City of the Mediterranean. And he can barely get off the boat without being bombarded with pagan worship and idols. This makes me think of the first time I set foot in a very strange and foreign land as a teenager once. It's a place called Las Vegas. We, uh, we had some basketball tournaments there. And um, honestly, I had never seen anything like it. Huge hotels and bright, loud casinos and lots of loud people. Um, but the thing that sticks with me most was seeing the little cards all across the street and the sidewalks um, with pictures on them and phone numbers on them. And if you've been there, you probably have, have seen this. Needless to say, they call it Sin City for a reason, right? They call it Sin City for a reason. Well, here we have Paul in the Athens, Greece. And he doesn't have his family or his basketball team there with him. He is alone, completely alone. And the text makes it very clear that he is taken back by what he sees. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that this city was full of idols. A little bit about the common religious views of the Greeks in that day. Um, one author writes this, the ancient Greeks had no single guiding work of scripture like the Jewish Torah, the Christian Bible, or the Muslim Quran. Nor did they have a strict priestly caste. The relationship between human beings and deities was based on the concept of exchange. Gods and goddesses were expected to, to give gifts. And likewise, votive offerings then were a physical expression of thanks on the part of the individual worshipers, end quote. Now, there were 12 principal deities in the Greek pantheon, okay? Some of their gods. Foremost, Zeus, right? We've heard the name Zeus, the sky god, the father of the gods. You had Hades and Poseidon, who reigned over the underworld and the sea. You had Hera, Zeus's sister and wife, uh, who was queen of the gods. You also had wise Athena, where we get the word Athens, the patron goddess of Athens, who typically appears in full armor with spear and shield. She was the patroness of weaving and carpentry. He also had Apollo, the god of music and prophecy. And he had many cult sites throughout Greece. Not to mention Apollo's twin sister Artemis. Hermes, the messenger of God, who you'll remember back from Acts 14... Who was, who was Barnabas and, and Paul claimed to have been? Hermes and Zeus. You remember that in Lystra? And the list goes on. Aphrodite, Dionysus, Ares. The list goes on. Basically, there was, a, there was a God for everything. And so there were many, many temples and high places. And of course, literal carved idols. Statues all over the place. One philosopher is famous for saying... It's easier to meet a God in Athens than a man. This is where Paul is. The same Paul who was taught the law of God from his childhood. The same Paul who knew very well the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. 
So it shouldn't surprise us to read that Paul was deeply provoked as he walked around this museum of depravity. This had to be some serious culture shock for Paul. Imagine sailing over 200 miles under the heat of persecution and then being dropped off by yourself in an absolutely pagan and foreign land. The text says his spirit was provoked within him. He saw that the city was full of idols. Right? His spirit was provoked. This, mean, this means upset or stirred within him. Paul became irritated and angry that this city was drowning in idols. Again, this word provoked, proxuno, is the same word the Septuagint uses to describe God's being provoked at idolatry. His anger toward idolatry. Remember the golden calf. Deuteronomy 9.7 says, Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath. And the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. Get the, get the feel of what we mean by provoked here. Psalm 106, 28. Then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds and a plague broke out among them. This is the kind of provoking which was happening in Paul's heart. The fear of man Took, back, took a back seat to the healthy and righteous fear of the Lord in the heart of Paul here. The Spirit of God burned within him as he saw this idolatrous corruption of the fallen mankind. So a question for us here today is, are we stirred up inside? Are we provoked when we look around at the Athens of the United States of America today? and all the idols that are standing around. No, there aren't a lot of carved statues. But are you provoked as, as God was with ancient Israel, or as provoked as Paul was with ancient Greece, that human beings made in the image of God have chosen to worship the creation rather than their creator? Think about it. The most, the most prestigious universities and academically rigorous institutions, the Harvards, the Yales, Right? The Princetons of our world have become cesspools of worship of the creation rather than the creator. Our nation exalts almighty man and bows down to idols of intellect and wealth and sex and pleasure and fame and luxury. And yet the Bible calls them all fools for their lack of the fear of the Lord. I mean, here we are in Pride Month, 2022 a nationally recognized holiday to have parades and celebrate the sin of sexual immorality in all its various forms. Is that not the idol of self manifesting itself, the, the worship of human beings' autonomous expression of whatever they feel? Friends, your land is saturated with as many, if not more, idols than Athens. Here's the proof. The fact that when you see a rainbow, your first thought is not God's covenant promise, is it? No, it's not. You see a rainbow and without blinking, you think of homosexuality. Our nation demands that every individual, as well as every major corporation, bow to the knee of the God of sexual lust and perversion or suffer the consequences. And not only that, but we walk around on the blood-stained ground of millions of innocent lives which were sacrificed on other altars, altars of career and comfort and convenience. The point is we live in Athens. And the sad reality for many of us is that we're not provoked about it. If we're being honest, we don't share that burning passion for, for righteousness that Paul did. If anything, we're a lot more like Jonah as he walked the streets of Nineveh just, just waiting for it to burn. 
right? Just get me out of here. I don't want to go. Don't we tend to take that attitude? I pray that each of us takes a lesson from Paul here and becomes rightly shocked and, and stirred and provoked by the fact that much worship happens in our land and yet Christ is often not the object or recipient of that worship. That should burn us up on the inside. And we should not be content to leave things as they are. And nor was Paul, as we see back in our text. His spirit was provoked within him, and he saw that the city was full of idols. So, verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So how does Paul respond to all this idolatry he sees? He doesn't keep quiet. He doesn't sit in the hotel room and wait for Silas and Timothy to pick him up. He speaks. He gets busy. He goes straight to the local synagogue where other Jews worshipped and talked to them about Christ. As we've seen before, this is his custom, right? To reason with the local Jews that the Christ is Jesus. But then in verse 17, we see another aspect of Paul's ministry. He also goes to the marketplace. He goes daily to the marketplace with the gospel. He goes to the town square, he sets up camp, and he tells people about Jesus. One commentator writes, In Greco-Roman times, the marketplace was the hub of urban life, a center for commerce and trade, but also for the sharing of ideas. Paul wanted to engage directly with as many Gentiles as possible in the place where discussion and debate might easily take place, end quote. So friends, this is, a, this is a brief point, but it must be said. We must not be content to live a private Christianity. The Bible knows nothing of a private faith that's kept only within the bounds of the church building and the household. Yes, the gospel must thrive in those places, and let's not get caught in the overcorrection. Don't buy the lie that street preaching trumps family worship, or that, that gas station evangelism is more spiritual than gathering with the saints as we are now on a Sunday. It's not true. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So we must take the gospel outside the walls of the church building because Christ is not merely Lord of the home and the church. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of the school. He's Lord of the state. He is Lord of all. And this point is, this is what tends to get Christians in trouble. Right? As we saw a few weeks ago with Brother Adrian's message, they were accused of turning the world upside down because they let their Christianity leak through the walls of the church <laughs> and claiming that there is another king, apparently Jesus. And that's because there is another king. And we're his ambassadors. So the world must know. So Paul's proclaiming Christ in the synagogue and the marketplace, and lo and behold, it stirs up some attention. Stirs up some trouble. Verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Now remember, Athens has deep historical roots. And so many of the dominant philosophical schools of thought originated in Athens. And so it's no surprise to find out that as Paul's mixing it up in the public marketplace, he bumps into some of the major ideas of the day, right? Luke mentions specifically the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were, were known for their pursuit of happiness. A little bit about who they are. They were known for their pursuit of happiness. And contentment through detachment from social competition, get this, and the denial of divine interference in human affairs. One historicist writes it this way, in Epicureanism, the origin of everything is explained by the notion that there is no beginning of the atoms, the, the material. Atoms have always existed in space and time. The, the world we now see is a result of atomic collisions, therefore. Meaning human beings 
are not part of a created and purposeful order caused or ruled by God, but rather the accidental product of the collision of atoms. Some of the Epicureans were, they were, they were materialists, right? Physical matter is eternal. Epicureanism essentially liberates people then from the fear of God, because if there are any gods, they're very far away. They're very distant. They're not involved in human affairs. They're disinterested with us. Therefore, Epicureanism eliminates the category of sin because there is none. And even the fear of death no longer needs to be feared because there's no, there's no judgment. Therefore, the goal of modern America, I mean, Epicureanism, is the pursuit of our own physical pleasure. These things should sound familiar to us. Imagine how Paul must have felt speaking to a group of pagans who actually believed themselves to be the result of random cosmic material processes, who believed God was a joke, there's no sin, there's no meaning to life whatsoever, and therefore they followed their heart's desires into whatever passions they felt. Imagine that. I know it's hard for us to do that, but imagine. <laughs> but the Epicureans, they weren't the only school of thought that Luke mentions here. He also said the Stoics. Right? Stoic philosophers. So the Stoics believed that the human race was one proceeding from a single point of origin. Okay? Um, they were essentially pantheistic, right? Meaning that that let's see, one definition here says that with with pantheism, the doctrine that the universe conceived as the whole is God, and conversely, that there is no God but the combined substance of forces. That's technical. Let me give you what that means. God is the world, and the world is God. They are one and the same. They are one and the same in Stoicism. Okay? God was actually in everything. Stoics were ultimately fatalists. Okay? Therefore, they thought in terms not of freedom and liberation, like the Epicureans, they thought in terms of fatalistic passivity. If the goal of Epicureanism is to enjoy life, the Stoics just want to endure life. That's why we say things like he had a Stoic look on his face, right? You're, you're, you're enduring life. They believe that was true virtue, true wisdom. Now again, imagine how Paul must have felt speaking to all these different people and all these different worldviews that they carried. Right? You had those Jews in the synagogue, you had the plural, pluralistic common Greeks of Athens and all their idols, you had the hedonistic Epicureans who lived for pleasure, and then you had the hardened robot-like Stoics. That's a, that's a diverse crowd. So how in the world is Paul going to address all of this? Before we look at what he says, I want us to see what the Greeks thought of him. Okay, verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him and said, what does this babbler wish to say? Name calling. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus, Jesus, and the resurrection. And so here we have representatives of the leading philosophies of Athens, right? And they're, what are they doing? They're looking down their noses at Paul. Paul, one of the most brilliant minds of the first century, being called a, literally a, a babbler, a seed picker. Somebody who just picks up ideas and then regurgitates them as if they're his own. This is an insult. So Paul is looked at as a joke here. And so the philosophers decide, you know what? Let's take this guy to the Areopagus and let him present his case there. Verse 19. <clears throat> and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So they take this babbler, Paul, to the Areopagus, right? Or it might say Mars Hill in your translation. 
The Areopagus was the seat of the Athenian government. Okay, it's where big decisions are made, judgments are determined. Ideas are scrutinized and discussed. Long speeches happen at the Areopagus. The Areopagus was the shorter hill, which stood just in front of the larger hill, the Acropolis, you may have heard of, right? with its highest point being the, the highest point of the city. You've probably seen or heard the Acropolis with its famous temples like the Parthenon, all these temples that are dedicated to these various Greek gods. You can go there today for $20, I found out. Get a ticket to the Acropolis and explore it. You won't find any actual gods there, though. Um, they didn't stand the test of time. That's a side note. But anyway, we have, we have Paul, right, on the shorter hill, the meeting place of the Areopagus, right? And he has the, the Acropolis in the background, many temples. This is, this is an intimidating place to be, probably. <laughs> this had to be a fearful situation for Paul. It reminds me of God commanding Moses to go into that foreign land, Egypt. Right? Remember, he, he met him in the burning bush, and he told him to be the mouthpiece of God to Pharaoh himself, the highest authority of that day. Exodus 4.10, but Moses said to the Lord, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and, and tongue. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go. And I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? We can understand the fear of Moses in Egypt, but what a comforting reality to know that God will give him the words. God will not depart from him. He'll give him the words. Or think of what Christ taught his disciples, Luke 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Again, we can understand the fear of the apostles here, but what a comforting reality directly from the Lord Jesus that the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. You'll be all right. So just like Moses and just like the disciples, Paul's in a similar boat here, standing at the Areopagus. And yet the fear of the Lord triumphed over the fear of man so that Paul faithfully walked into his mission with boldness. Let's look at what he says. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Now there were likely multiple altars with this inscription. Um, the tradition of worshiping unknown gods traces back centuries to ancient Athens, and the, the severe famine that they faced once upon a time. It's said that the prophet Epimenides from Crete came and suggested to them that if they would just set up various altars and sacrifice on them, eventually they would appease whatever God needed appeased, and the problem would be solved. So the Romans and the Greeks, remember, they were, they were very pluralistic, lots of gods. They understood everything in terms of many gods being served and appeased by men. So these unknown God altars were cover your base altars. <laughs> Whoever you are, God, just take this and leave me alone. Paul takes notice of this and capitalizes on the opportunity. He says, you're all very religious, obviously. You even worship gods you don't know. And you're right that you don't know God. Allow me to introduce you to him. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now stop right there. In two verses, 
Paul just dismantled both Stoicism and Epicureanism. He says, God is the maker of the world, which would imply that God existed before the world did, which is anti-Epicurean. And this also implies that the God who brought the world into existence is not himself one with that world, which denies Stoicism. There's a hard creature-creator distinction. Not to mention this God does not dwell in man-made temples, nor does he need to be served by human hands and appease. Which is 100%, this, this is paradigm shifting for the Greeks. This was 100% the culture of Athens and the foundation of the Greek system. Their gods needed all sorts of things. Right? So just like that, without apology, without embarrassment, Paul gives them healthy creation theology without hesitation. And, and notice, notice Paul's speech doesn't die the death of a thousand disclaimers. Right? Notice he doesn't say, now, here, that's one way to look at it, but here's another way to, to look at it. Or, or um, you know, I like to think of God like this. Or, he, doesn't, he doesn't go that way. He gives them biblical truth, the biblical worldview built on a solid Christian theology proper. <laughs> He stands confidently with Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. End of story. Paul delivers the facts about the sovereign God. And though he's speaking to a, a Greek audience, he never actually mentions the Old Testament specifically here. You can hear the scripture oozing out of his words, Right? No doubt he's thinking of Genesis 1 and 2. No doubt he's thinking of Psalm 50, verse 10, where it says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the Lord says. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. I love Psalm 50, verse 12. If I were hungry, God says, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. This is how God speaks. It's all mine. Maybe Paul was even thinking back to a, a recent sermon he heard back in Acts 7. Remember Stephen? Remember how Paul stood there and approved of his murder? One thing Stephen said, Acts 7, 48, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? The point is, in, in a few quick verses, Paul unapologetically presents God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. And he hits on some of the key systematic categories we have for theology proper. If you've been in that class, I hope you're enjoying it. Not least of which being God's aseity, right? Ah, from, say, self. Meaning God exists completely and utterly of himself, by himself. He needs nothing, by definition. He is the one in whom all other things find their source, existence, and continuance. He is because he is. Opposed to what Stephen Furtick might teach you, that when God says, I am, I'm trying to help you see that you are. No, it's not the case. The I am says that I am and y'all ain't. That's what God says. God needs nothing from us. And remember the Greeks believe that God's needed all sorts of things from us. Verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. Some translations say one man. Others use one blood here. The Greek simply says, and he made from one every nation. So Paul believed, Genesis 1, 27 and 28, that God created man in his own image and likeness, both male and female, and that male and female fruit, uh, fruitfully multiplied and filled the earth with their offspring, right? Paul believes that. Paul believed Genesis 10, which shows us that even after the flood of Noah's day, 
the sons of Noah repopulated the world. So Paul had no problem teaching them that the creator and sustainer of all things is also sovereign over all peoples and people groups and nations. Right? And they all happen to come from the same ancestor. What a radical statement to a bunch of Greeks, right? Who took much pride in their Greekness. And honestly, the, the, the radical concept being presented here would be very helpful for our world to understand as well. Full transparency, church, I'm, I'm getting tired of the constant talk about multiple races. I'm getting tired of it. That's why the, the minute you use the term race with me, I may tune you out. I will not bow to your wrong presupposition that there are actually multiple human races. We can talk about multiple ethnicities. We can talk about ethnic pride. The Bible has a lot to say about that, but don't buy the lie that says we are fundamentally and racially different as human beings. Imagine the, the lunacy of an older sister looking at her little brother and saying she's actually genetically superior to him. Y'all got the same parents. So do we. We are all siblings in Adam and Eve. So down with white supremacy and also down with black supremacy and all shades of brown supremacy. Whatever we can put together, we need a biblical anthropology. I'll stop there on that point. Paul also mentions not only the origin of all human beings being God, but the divine sovereignty of when and where the various nations dwell. Did you catch that? We share common ancestors in Adam and Eve, but there's a lot of history between them and us, right? Which was also part of God's good and perfect plan. Paul makes it very clear that God is not only responsible for the origins of humanity, but also the ongoing development and growth of the nations of the earth, right? The Epicureans would have denied that. Remember, gods are distant. They're hands off. He didn't merely kick off the world in creation and then let everything play out to see how it would go. No, that's deism. No, God is intimately involved in and sovereign over both history and geography. And none of this is meaningless. He has a purpose in all of it, which we see in the next verse. 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Now, there's a lot packed into those verses. We don't have time to look at every detail. But something I want to just notice here is that Paul argues that God's divine purpose in creating and ordaining human history ultimately culminates in man seeking and finding God. That's the point. Man exists to know God, that he might glorify him and enjoy him forever. Adam was created to be in communion with God himself, and he was for a short season, right, until the fall. But even after the fall, the purpose of human existence on this planet is that they might come to know the true and living God and worship him for all eternity. This fact is the reason Paul's in Athens. Why are you so far from home, Paul? <laughs> Think about that. Why aren't you back in Tarsus, taking it easy, thanking God that you're saved, but just waiting for heaven? Why are you here? Why are you putting yourself through this? It's because Paul believes that, that he preaches this gospel, and it's actually sufficient to save the nations. Not just Jew, but Gentile as well. Right? He believes Christ has commissioned him to proclaim the good news of reconciliation. So as we saw in a prior sermon, Paul understands himself to be the continued work of Christ in the world. To shine as a light to the nation. And it's this understanding that motivates his labors for the Lord. 
He's already told the Greeks they are very religious, right? Meaning they take worship very seriously. Yet Paul also knows that unless they hear the gospel of Christ, their seeking and groping for God through idolatry will only damn them in the end. So Paul shows these pagans that though they think there are many gods who are far away, far from the affairs of man, the true God is actually very near and involved and and present among his creation. He's not the creation, Stoics. They are not one and the same. They are different, yet he is near to them all. Therefore, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11.6 So Paul establishes all of this biblical truth about the reality of God from a biblical worldview. And then he does something really interesting. He, He quotes pagan resources to double down on his point. Do you see that? As some of your own poets have said, Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. This is believed to be a quote from that Cretan prophet we talked about, Epimenides, right? Paul will uh, mention him later in Titus 1. And then he says, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. That actually is pulled from a hymn to Zeus. (laughs) Paul uses it here. Nevertheless, it's interesting that Paul quotes these sources in support of his gospel proclamation. What Paul's doing here is using familiar language and context to help the Athenians understand the truth. Because all truth is God's truth. Amen? All truth belongs to the Lord. And all humans are made in His image. So even the lost can stumble into truth from time to time. A broken clock is right twice a day. So Paul uses these quotes to to highlight the fact that God really is near to his creation. And we are his image bearers. And he capitalizes on this point in the next verse when he says, Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or Any image formed by the art and imagination of man. You see Paul's logic here? Paul's arguing that we are made from God in his image and not the other way around. It's just plain wrong to believe that God bears the form of something that our minds could conceive of and put together. We already talked about how provoked to anger God is at this concept of idolatry and it's for this sinful worship that repentance is necessary across the planet. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. This should remind us of his his sermon to to in Lystra in uh, Acts 14, 16. Right? And, and it says, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Remember that? The point Paul is making in Lystra, and the point that he's making in Athens here, is that all human beings have taken part in the common grace of God. If you've breathed his air, you owe him something. Yet not all have thanked him or glorified him for his gracious provision. Rather, the world has cursed him and suppressed the truth about him because of a superior idolatrous love for sin. All people everywhere, therefore, must repent and turn from their wicked ways. We're all guilty. The gospel levels the playing field. But why must we repent? He answers it here in verse 31. Why must we repent? Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all. How? By raising him from the dead. Friends, the great and final judgment day is coming. 
If you want to boil Paul's sermon down into three simple points, it's this. There is one sovereign creator God. All human beings, therefore, have a responsibility to seek Him in repentance and faith. Because one day He will judge the entire world through the resurrected Christ. The climactic thrust of Paul's speech is the fact of the judgment to come. And though he doesn't quote any specific verse here, he speaks on the consistent authority of the whole Bible. (laughs) That this is the reality. This is truth. Psalm 96.12 Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for He comes. For He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. Ecclesiastes 12.13 The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The judgment is coming, the Bible says. Remember what Jesus taught in the New Testament. John 5.22 The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears My Word and believes Him who has sent Me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. He goes on to say, John 5.27, And He, the Father, has given Him, the Son, authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the righteousness of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. These are just a few examples. But friends, the entirety of Scripture warns us of the coming judgment of God. It is a fact we all must reckon with. Our forefathers understood this. Our forefathers in the faith, right? They understood it very well. Raise your hand if you're on Brother Lupashek's theologian quote list. Anybody? Raise your hand. A little shout out. If you're not, you're missing out. You're missing out. He dropped one the other day. Polycarp. Right? For example, Polycarp, first century bishop of Smyrna, the student of the Apostle John. What did Polycarp say? When being persecuted for his faith, he's famous for having said this, you threaten me with fire which burns for a little while and is soon extinguished. You do not know the coming fire of judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. What are you waiting for? Do what you wish. And they did, and they killed him. Another quote, 17th century theologian Matthew Henry. There is no escaping God's avenging eye. No going out of the reach of his hand. Rocks and mountains. Think of Revelation 6. Rocks and mountains will be no better shelter at last than fig leaves were at first. Followers of Christ take Christ's words seriously. So when Jesus teaches us not to fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, we take that seriously. And so should the rest of the world. The judgment day is coming. And Paul confirms that fact on the grounds of Christ's resurrection. Jesus Christ conquered death and rose from the grave. And that is the guarantee that He is the chosen Messiah and King of the ages. The resurrected Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the long-awaited Son of Man who ascended on the clouds to the Ancient of Days to receive an eternal kingdom. And at this very moment, our Lord sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning until He puts all His enemies under His feet. This fact should cause each of us to tremble with fear and reverence for Christ. 
But as we'll see in the response of the Athenians, that's, that's not always going to be the response. Look at verse 32. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Remember, most Greeks denied resurrection whatsoever. But others said, we'll hear you again about this. Come back next time. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. Praise God. Among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So the instant results of Paul's preaching, right? He gives them faithful biblical theology. And what's the result? Well, some laughed. Right? Specifically that part about the resurrection. That's hilarious. Others say maybe later. And others actually believe that very day. Including a member of the Athenian ruling authorities in Areopagate. Luke drops that detail in there. And friends, more often than not, we too will see this sort of spectrum of responses that Paul did as we proclaim the gospel. Some will mock us. Others will blow us off. But yet others will repent and believe. And this calls for patient endurance on behalf of the saints in faith, not growing weary in well-doing. We've got to remember that we address our angry, hostile, idolatrous world today firmly rooted in the same promises that Moses and all God's prophets and even the apostles stood upon. They didn't have to fear. Because God himself, the almighty I am, was with them. And he would give them the words to speak. We too must fear the Lord above men and trust that when the word of God goes out through us, it will not return to him void or empty. It will accomplish that which he has purposed. He's a sovereign God. He'll do it. He'll do it. So, so, What have we seen in our text today? Quite simply, we have witnessed a man whose fear of God outweighed his fear of man. This is the same Paul who will say in Galatians 1, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So standing in the Athens and standing on the authority of Scripture... And prompted by the Holy Spirit's power, Paul unashamedly told the world the truth about God and creation and sin and Christ and judgment. And how did he do that? Well, it started with the healthy fear of the Lord above man. He therefore had a provoked heart for the lost. He believed in the power of the gospel. And he was motivated by the fact of the coming judgment of the resurrected Christ. So church family, may each of us pray, pray earnestly for a healthier fear of the Lord. Pursue it by bathing yourself in his word. Know God and fear him rightly. May we be a people who are provoked and rightly stirred up, therefore, for the glory of God and his righteousness. Let us be a church who refuses to passively stand by as the lies and idolatry of the culture permeate our community and our world and our families. Don't stand by and let that happen. Be provoked. May we boldly speak the truth in love that God is going to judge the world one day in righteousness through the universal authority of the resurrected Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And come what may, let us be willing to become humble, happy, and confident fools for Christ. They'll look down their nose at you. They will. Embrace it. Become a fool for Christ, joyfully heralding His truth that all those who seek him in repentance and faith will be saved from the wrath to come, while all those who reject him will be judged. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen.